Something that's very concerning that no longer do we care uh, for the dying and no longer do we have an, the individual does no, no longer exists so we're facing quite a different world than what we did the last time I spoke here at Mardi Gras so um, I thought it's always interesting just to know why people have arrived to where they are and and this is this is my journey and um, and I think that this journey will be paralleled by many, many people everywhere. And I hope that out of it, we get a group of people that can survive the way our world is at the moment. So I was, um, you know, a pretty sick practitioner in Gundawindi. And um, I, however, um, attracted the, well, I opened my own practice and basically the other practice in town wanted the monopoly. So, and they were, and she, the head of that practice was also the med super of Gundawindi Hospital. So they basically had pretty much control over healthcare in Gundawindi, uh, apart from my solo practice. So I was targeted and eventually notified to ARPA for all sorts of things. And this was the first time I realised that um, that doctors aren't necessarily benevolent people, um, and that. Really, and the medical board and APRA are there to destroy doctors that don't agree with them or break their rules, and in fact, they don't care what happens to patients. Um, so, you know, you complain about your a patient complains to the medical board or APRA, it simply goes nowhere. But should any doctor do anything against their guidelines, anything to do with sex or drugs or whatever, they are destroyed. There is no, um, there's basically no try, you're convicted and punished um, before you know, you're hearing. So my business was destroyed long before uh, the ARPA thing was settled. That took five years. Um, so shortly, I, I actually got suspended um, on the day I was diagnosed with um, secondary melanoma in my scalp. So, um, 
that sort of made it a little easier because, you know, with the cancer journey ahead of me, it would have been rather difficult to have continued practicing medicine at that point anyway. Um, so I basically had it all through my scalp. It went down. I've had um, the glands removed there. It went to near my left renal vein and then spread throughout both lungs. And at this point, um, I had started to research cannabis medicine and about also looking at other cancer treatments. And I found out about a treatment called dendritic cell therapy. And I had to travel to Germany for that. And it's still a scientifically based treatment. It's where they take the white cells and convert them um, into dendritic cells, which are the really good seek and destroy cells of our immune system. Uh, and then they attach a genetic marker for the cancer and inject it back into you. Um, and unlike the immunomodulators that they use here in Australia um, and the, this, the effects of the vaccine that's coming out, um, dendritic cells, um, there's no long-lasting effect, which is why you have to have top-ups all the time. So you don't get permanent changes to your immune system like all these other, other drugs do. Uh, and basically, that's what put me into remission. And while I was in Europe, every time I'd go to Amsterdam first, and this was in the early days, there wasn't really any oil available or anything like that. So I just used to go and saturate myself with cannabis in Amsterdam and, and catch the train and take it all back to Germany because this clinic was a, a little medieval town right in the centre of Germany called Dudestadt. And um, so I'd catch the train, it was about a six hour trip, and, um, and, and sort of bring it all with me. So, um, and so basically they were the two things that I credit for going into remission. Unfortunately, the Keytruda and the Yervoy, which are the immunomodulators they gave me here in Australia, has left me with long-term sequelae. Um, and I would not recommend them to anybody. Um, but we weren't allowed to have dendritic cell therapy in Australia because there were no peer-reviewed studies, despite there being over 30 years of research from this doctor who started out at Gottingen University and then opened his own clinic to get his research away from Big Pharma and University Academia. So, of course, it's not accepted in Australia. And because the cells are frozen, we're outside the 24-hour limit, and so that if they can't come to me, I have to go to Germany. Um, so this was the situation that um, I was at, um, at the same time as all the medical board stuff going on. Um, and while I was researching cannabis medicine, there on the fringes of society was another group, um, the anti-vaxxers. And as we know, that's a very taboo subject. Um, though, if you'll notice, people are starting to talk about vaccines a little more now. And, and this was where the third part of what I said in the title, casting off the shackles of corporatocracy. And this was when I first started to realise um, that medicine in Australia just no longer existed the way we thought. Um, so basically, I found out that the vaccine companies were given um, immunity from... Um, any sort of legal action in the late 1980s. So if you wanted to sue for vaccine damage, you had to sue the American government. And to date, there's actually been $6 billion payout from the American government for vaccine damage that apparently doesn't exist. Um, but I hope that's not what I'm here for today. It's just an example of when I'm saying that the scales started to fall from my eyes in many, many ways. And also, it was... Like, the oncologists really weren't concerned. They didn't expect you to live. So there was never any optimism or positivity. It was basically, oh, we'll just jog you along until you die. And, um, and when I got hospitalised the second time from the key treater and they said, oh, you can't have that anymore, we're discharging you. And that was the last I ever heard. Um, didn't follow up to see whether I'd lived or died or anything like that, you know. I'd love to go back to them one day and go, no, 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 no. But anyway... Um, so, and in amongst all of this, um, we, I, you know, we basically, uh, it was actually my son who started with the political side of it, and we did a big rally in Brisbane, I think it was 2014, and it was to date still the biggest rally that we've had for cannabis legalisation, um, and it was for medical cannabis um, in Australia. So we have, um, 
So that's, then I started my cannabis activist activities, um, going to rallies and then um, getting to know the people, or Reno, I used to come to Nimbin many years ago, know the people in Nimbin and started to do the workshops. And, um, and then discovered that, you know, cannabis is just a whole new field of medicine. And, um, and it's just, and, but basically it's a herbal medicine. So then I thought, well, I'd started to grow herbs um, when I sort of had the cancer because it got me out and you know, got a bit of vitamin D and um, not too much sun, of course, being no one owner. Um, so I really got interested in the plant world and went back to uni and I've done two or three years of um, a bachelor's degree in Western Herbal Medicine. Um, and that's when I just came across a thing called the Flexnor Report. Have any of you heard of the Flexnor Report? Well, it was commissioned in, um, and, and published in 1912, and it was looking at medical education in the States um, because they thought it was quite poor quality. And so the report came back and said that, yes, it was quite poor quality, and this is what needs to be improved. But this um, report was actually commissioned by the Carnegie Foundation, um, and uh, which one? Whichever one had the chemical company at the time. And... Um, Anyway, so basically, the upshot of that is the only medical schools that got funding were those that followed the allopathic model, were those that only offered pharmaceutical treatment. So that, in fact, is what sent natural medicine into the wilderness. And that happened at the beginning of last century. And, um, and then, of course, the next thing that happened was the prohibition of hemp. Well, actually, the prohibition of other, like, um, you know, opium and things like that, actually can be counted into that as well. Um, but then basically came 1937 and the prohibition of hemp and therefore cannabis. And, um, and it's very clear now to see that um, stopping people from smoking the demon weed was never ever the reason um, for making cannabis illegal. It was because it threatened the petrochemical industry that was just emerging. It threatened the paper and textile industry, especially the paper industry. Um, DuPont had just patented nylon. Hearst had just patented the process for making um, paper out of wood pulp. Um, so they did not want a resurgence of hemp as a crop. Um, so when we look at the evil things that were done in the 20th century, I do think that um, DuPont and his cronies and Anslinger were the most evil of all because they were the ones that put our planet on the track it's on now, which is petrochemical dependency. And um, so it's sort of like cannabis to me is like not just the catalyst, but it represents all the things that are wrong with our world today and all the things that we want to fix. And I suppose that's why I'm trying to bring it all in together. You know, it's not just about cannabis. It's about not being able to choose what medicines we put to our body anymore. It's not just about cannabis. It's about um, reducing how much um, fossil fuels we use, you know, to do recyclable energy. You know, cannabis isn't the only answer, but it makes us think about it. Um, you know, it, it, makes it, look, it makes us look at, at just herbal medicine, at plant medicine again. And the fact that, you know, we have been taught that, oh no, you know, the single molecules of the pharmaceutical company have got to be better than any plant that grows in the garden. And it wasn't until I started learning phytochemistry that I realised that, hey, learning about one molecule is nothing to learning about the hundreds of phytochemicals that are found in plants and all the, the actions that they have and what they do. Absolutely fascinating. Um, so it, this is the, and this leads us to what the main problem is with cannabis as medicine being um, given out by doctors is because they're following an allopathic model. You know, they think that one size fits all and, okay, so you use this particular cannabis medicine for this and if that doesn't work, oh, well, it doesn't work. And it's really just displaying the total ignorance of what cannabis medicine is, which is a totally individualised type of medicine where you, it is trial and error. That's how it's meant to be. Um, really, no herbal medicine can be uh, researched and trialled using double-blind randomised control trials because you just, just simply too many variables. Um, when you've got a single molecule and you can say, okay, there's that molecule and placebo. 
and we'll make sure we use this person and that, you know, that group and that group. But you can't do that with any herbal medicine because each plant has got up to hundreds of actives in it. So you can't, you can't possibly um, sort of randomise it or control it completely. And the other, the, the main thing that the doctors can't seem to get through their heads is that it doesn't matter because it is the safest medicine we have on earth. Um, as long as a plant has safety studies done on it, there is no need for any trials. It's just a, it's basically trial and error, what we call N equal one studies, where each person is their own trial or longitudinal observational studies where we simply have a whole lot of patients and we collect data. And eventually over time we will realise, hey, this particular cannabinoid profile seems to work very well most of the time for epilepsy or, you know, or for cancer or whatever. Um, and we're only at the very, very beginning of a very exciting time in medicine, um, except the doctors just don't get it. <laughs> because they just can't seem to think of the patient as an individual and doing the um, and basically you know doing individualized treatment and the other thing they don't like to do is hand the control back to the patient now cannabis is really a completely patient controlled medicine it is the patient that comes back and tells you it did this it didn't do that and the doctor and patient discuss together what they would be doing um, now, I think that, given, yes. What are they afraid of? Um, that's a very good question, and I've thought, I've really thought about it a lot. First of all, um, doctors have egos. There's some doctors that don't, but on the whole, doctors have egos. They don't like to be told what to do because they know best, um, and they don't like to be wrong. Um, so that's one factor. Um, but probably the main factor why doctors just aren't really embracing cannabis medicine is fear. It is pure and simple fear. Because APRA and the medical board are basically so rabid at destroying doctors that doctors are simply terrified. Um, the doctors that have managed to uh, fly under the radar, and some of them will be speaking here at this Mardi Gras, have no idea how they did it. No idea how they managed to do what they're doing now because so many doctors have been destroyed simply because they disagree with the medical board. And um, are you winding up? No, you want to, you open the door about Yeah. Ah, uh, okay, yeah. Yes. Um, Paul was just wanting me to expand a little bit on the APRA experience, where basically um, it was over a very small amount of morphine. Um, it took five years of going backwards and forwards and, um, uh, and one very kangaroo court hearing. Um, and they, the upshot of it was is that I had my registration um, cancelled for one week. So I'm not actually a deregistered doctor, I'm simply a non-registered doctor. Um, and for me to go back and do medicine now, for a start, the refresher course would cost close to $30,000 and you must do that course because that's the one they want you to do. And because drugs were in the mix of my experience with APRA, I would be urine tested to within an inch of my life. And when I say urine test, we're talking two, three times a week for several months and then the frequency goes down. We're talking about them watching you from the urinary meatus into the cup. It's level one supervision, which is the most demeaning that you can get. Um, and you basically, yes, and you're, it's very punitive, you're punished if you um, 
you know, and basically just the fact that I'm out, I had a legal cannabis prescription would be enough for the conditions imposed upon me by ARP would be so onerous I could never consider going back. Um, but really, I don't want to. I don't want to be part of such a corrupt system anymore. I mean, we're now living under a medical dictatorship. Um, you know, our state, Queensland, is being run by an unelected bureaucrat who is a narcissistic sociopath. Um, so we don't have a lot of hope in Queensland. Um, and but there is nothing anyone can do. If anyone, the, the powers of the medical boards are written into the constitution, and um, and if you, um, no barrister will touch it. You cannot get a barrister that will take the medical board to the Supreme Court and fight their powers. Their powers are untrammeled. And I think people need to understand that. We really are living with a medical dictatorship. I tried to get my sister out of quarantine, took her over to cancer treatment. Um, and I ended up having to stop because I was just getting too upset every day because um, I could not get anybody to even care. They really didn't care that with a brain cancer that she could die in a hotel room. They did not care. I need to really push that point. They don't care. So there's no point in saying, oh, but what about this person's story, that person's story, but that's really bad, you know. They don't care. Hope I've got that point through. Um, so there is no such thing as the individual. Dying is no longer sacred. Um, so we really, yeah, basically. I mean, and then my poor sister at the end, all she ever wanted to do was smoke either her cigarettes or her cannabis. And of course, wasn't allowed to go outside in the private courtyard at the palliative care unit at Reckon Hospital um, to even have a cigarette, you know. So, however, my son chucked a manic fit at Reckon Hospital um, and she was the first person at Reckon Hospital to be able to vape on the ward. So, yep, she, yes. Was that vaping nicotine or cannabis? No, cannabis. First person in regular hospital to vape on the ward, thanks to my son chucking a bipolar fit at them. Wasn't my method, but it worked. Um, very hard to go mad at someone when they've actually achieved something quite wonderful. Um, but yeah, he wasn't very nice about it, but it, it, it worked and, and we actually managed to, to do that. Now, I think, you know, is there anything that anybody here would like me to expand upon? You know, because I mean, basically that's my story up to this point, and I'm really happy to talk about anything to do with cannabis. I can, I can discuss it from the seed to the patient. Any questions you've got, um, just ask away. Come on, Paul, you have to have a, you have to have a hard one for me, surely. I actually do have questions for you, but not about cannabis. So I'll hit you up later. Okay, okay. So, any questions? That's really interesting. Um, so the question is that after smoking cannabis for so many years and um, you know and then just not being able to smoke it anymore and going on to the oil, she's developed really bad migraines with the oil. Um, and that's really interesting because um, I have, you know, testing my own oil and slightly overdosed, it can trigger a migraine. So I'm suspecting that your oil might be really good and that the THC might be too high in it and that's what's triggering the migraine. Do you know, even if I take a teeny weeny bit, I've found that I've got a migraine. And I've looked it up and I've, I've seen that some some people migraines. Yes, it can. I mean, I would never use it as a migraine treatment, and I've had migraines since I was eight years old. And um, but for other people, it works. So I mean, I think the only option you've got is to go back to your weed and try and find a way. What about edibles? Does does that do the same thing? No, no, I'm just, if I, if I get a smoke. Oh, so even the smoking is. I feel like I've taken the lid off a can of words and wine. I was at the hospital this morning with my brain. Okay. I'll talk to you about that later a bit more because that's quite an interesting problem. Um, so that actually leads me to a point that um, many people are not aware about with cannabis is that we know about the endocannabinoid system now, 
that it's a regulatory system. Um, it's actually quite an amazing system. It's like the fine tuner. Um, and it, it just gently nudges everything back to being within normal range. And um, so, oh God, now I've forgotten what I was saying. Um, <laughs> it was about, uh, oh yes, that's right. Okay, so being in a regulatory system, it can either activate or inhibit. So that's fine. And the way it does it is by this a really amazing thing called retrograde transmission where it actually, the signal's going along the nerve and it actually travels back and adjusts things on the other side which is um, not very often used in the human body, so it's a pretty special way that it works. Now, so we were using exogenous cannabinoids, which is, you know, cannabis plant. Um, we, you know, up until fairly recently, um, we just had what grew in the ground. But with the hybridisation that happened during the 70s, um, we now have hundreds of strains. And But what the other thing that happened in the 90s was when the um, the they started growing indoor cannabis. It started out in, in, our, in the Netherlands and they actually used the um, knowledge from, from flower growing and transferred that over to cannabis because it's still a flower. Um, but of course it was very um, heavy with chemicals. So the skunk that came out in the 90s was in fact riddled with chemicals and when the black market organised crime people got onto it, they realised that um, by just breeding this really high THC stuff, um, that, that people were almost like getting addicted to it, and and you know, um, which of course you know, so we know why now. And so that's how come skunk and hydro got such a bad name. And of course we now know it's because it's completely devoid of CBD. There's only about 30 to 35 percent cannabinoids in the plant. So anyone who tells you that they've got a the THC level of 35, they're lying, because <laughs> it is actually botanically impossible. So what, basically, you've got this lot that's cannabinoids. And so basically by pushing up one cannabinoid, you're sacrificing the others. So you keep pushing the THC up higher and higher and higher. Eventually, you're not going to have much of a cannabinoid profile. It's going to be mainly THC. Um, and by sacrificing that, it can cause a whole heap of problems because unopposed cannabinoids, because there are, it's a regulatory type of chemical, it can flip its mechanism of action, which is why I was saying about migraine, if it's very high THC, it can cause migraines. Um, very high CBD, which doesn't all usually happen, you've got to get very high with that dosage, but that can cause seizures. Um, and of course, this is what happened by just giving people really high THC unopposed. They did create things that were like a withdrawal syndrome and stuff like that because it was just huge amounts, not that you would never find in nature. And this finding in nature actually brings me to one another point about CBD. You know, oh, CBD is the be all and end all. You know, CBD is what we want. It's not psychoactive. And blah blah blah. Mm, the cannabis got its reputation, um, you know, for being a medicine back in the millennia with a CBD content in the plant that would not have exceeded 2%. Um, so any of the healing properties of cannabis and all of the things that have been done down through the millennia have been done with no more than 2% CBD. So we need to understand that THC is the main healer. All the other cannabinoids are brilliant, they all play their part, but THC is still the number one. And so I would not advise anyone to have CBD unopposed on its own without at least having a little skerrick of THC in it as well. Um, yes? Okay, so we've got someone who'd like to be honest, you'd like to take CBD and, and be really enthusiastic about it, but just find it's a bit scary for some reason. Yes. Yes. And this is where the legislation is really annoying because so many people are choosing their medicine in case they have to drive. 
And that's crazy. Absolutely crazy. Because I would say to anybody, yeah, you can push your CBD up as high as you like. Just make sure there's a little bit of THC with it. It's not necessarily enough to even be psychoactive. But it must not be unopposed. And this is the trouble I'm finding with the legal prescriptions, is that the flower that we're getting is devoid of CBD. They're taking us back to the fucking hydrate ads. Um, because they're expecting you to take, to take your CBD oil with your flower. It doesn't work like that. Um, you know, yes, there's a mellowing effect at about the two hour mark, um, but if you're someone that, that actually can get a little bit edgy um, when there's no CBD, that will still happen because it will wear off. So, um, and there's plenty of high CBD flower around now, you know, so um, basically, for any of you getting a legal prescription and you're smoking the, or vaping the flower, excuse me, vaping, um, then that, make sure you get a high CBD flower to go with it. And that one can last for ages because you just need a sprinkle. You just need a little bit. Um, and that way you know that your cannabinoids are going to work the best that they could can the way that they're meant to work. Um, so that's just a little, yeah, that, a little um, caution that I've come across with the legal stuff. Um, is that it, um, yeah, they tend to make it. And the CBD oil is actually devoid of, of THC as well. Um, and, and that brings us back to, the, of course, the whole plant medicine principle and the entourage effect, which, of course, is nothing more or less than the plant synergy that we find everywhere in the plant world, where when you add two things together, the result can be greater than the sum of parts. Did I say that right? Thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, so, uh, and so like, I mean, isn't this a fascinating subject? Like, I mean, you could just, you could just talk about it all day, like, but however, there is a time limit, but any more questions? Because I'm quite enjoying this because we're getting to talk about different sorts of topics that you might not necessarily hear in any talks. Not that I take anything now because I'm too frightened, but hydro's not good for the medicine? No, no. You would never, ever consider, it, consider using black market cannabis to make medicine out of. Mm. Oh, absolutely. But you must grow indoor, organic, greenhouse, outdoor. Like, basically, it has to be organic. And look, I must admit, in the last seven years, there you go, there's another, the first seven years of the harvest, because in the, in, in the last seven years, um, we've now... Oh, God, I forgot what I'm saying again. Oh, I know, and I'm not even that stoned. It's terrible. Um, no, I think, no, I honestly think it's, no, I'm, just to explain a little one, a little scattered, is that I have had a pretty rough couple of weeks. My sister passed away um, a couple of weeks ago, and, you know, I was be talking about the vaping in the hospital. So um, I find that my attention tends to wander still a bit, I think, because um, that was a pretty heavy experience. So. Oh, okay. Another, so asking about CBD and psychoactivity. Okay. So let's. I think yeah, we need to look at this in a slightly different way because everybody says CBD is not hot, um, psychoactive. THC is the one that's psychoactive. Okay. In a way, that's correct. And if anyone is cannabis naive and they just start with CBD only, um, they will not notice a psychoactive effect. They may feel a little more mellow, but they won't actually notice it as psychoactive. However, get an old stoner who has been smoking all sorts of quality of weed down through many years, give them CBD and they hate it. They hate it because it changes the stone. Um, and I know myself, the first time I had um, just a high CBD smoke, um, it made me feel quite so spaced out that I couldn't, like, I didn't like it. I didn't really like it. And so that really explains why the old stoners don't like it. However, having said that, CBD is great. Like we, it's really, really good to have some CBD. Um, so, you know, we have to find a way to make CBD more acceptable to the stoners because they need it too. Um, but they're so used to going without it that they find it really different. So, 
instead of saying that CBD is not psychoactive, CBD can have a psychoactive effect by changing the way THC makes you psychoactive. So it's not strictly correct to say it's not psychoactive because it will change a stone, therefore it's contributed, hasn't it? And that's the best way to look at it, um, is that on its own you probably wouldn't notice it um, if you hadn't had cannabis before, but um, for cannabis, people who are used to cannabis, you have to get used to CBD. Um, the way I've done it is by slowly increasing my um, oil of CBD during the day, um, and now I'm actually finding I can tolerate higher amounts of CBD without it, you know, affecting the way I feel. Um, to this, you know, like the spacey thing and everything like that. Um, so a combination of oils and um, smoking or vaping is still probably the best way to go, actually. Um, you know, because there's things that you need um, a quick effect for, and of course vaping will do that, but oil is the thing that heals, that really heals. Um, one thing, another little tip to remember is that if your problem is in your gut, then you can vape all you like. It's not going to do you a great deal of good. Really, you need to have oils or edibles if you want to treat your gut. It, you know, maybe in the years to come we'll find out why. You know, maybe it's because of the receptors that are in the gut and that we get an extra effect by them attaching to those receptors, which doesn't happen um, if it's smoked or vaped. It may be something like that. We know that vaping CBD is wonderful for people with chronic obstructive airways disease um, because of the local anti-inflammatory effect. So, you know, it, we should consider um, whether you want it to act locally or systemically throughout your whole body. Any questions on that, um, that sort of idea about talking about which is the best um, delivery um, for which illness or whatever? Um, yes? Absolutely. The one thing that's not happening with legal cannabis at the moment are blending medicines. They're all single strain. And truly, and I mean, sort of, I've been doing this for seven years, six years, probably took a year to get going, and I had to get over it. I mean, I was dying, I had to get over the dying bit first before I could actually you know, sort of do anything more active. And um, and look, I found the best results uh, were blending um, for what you want. You know, I, th I see the patient, okay, arthritis, um, nothing much else wrong with them. Um, they will generally do quite well with a four to one THC CBD. Um, and if you, and in the times to come, when we will have a cannabinoid profile with every single product or strain, and then by that time we might have found out that a couple of the minor cannabinoids are particularly good. You know, so we'd look for a strain that has the cannabinoid profile that we would like, that we know has worked for this person in the past. And so as you can see, like it will become really complicated, but in some ways it's easy as well because it's such a forgiving medicine. Um, three quarters of the people will do really well just about on any cannabis for anything, and they'll, it'll, it'll, it will improve things. But the other quarter, with serious medical conditions and on uh, lots of other medications, they really need guidance, I think, from a cannabis clinician. Other than that, grow your own, make your own medicine, do what you like with it, but if you're a complicated medical person, then I think you need guidance. Um, does that answer your question? Okay, which I forgot to repeat. Are we just about, are you winding up? No, no, I just wanted to ask a question. Oh! <laughs> I'm so used to being wound up, you said. Um, oh, God, have I? Yeah, you've got 90 minutes session. Oh, God, we can have an intermission for this one. So what's your question? My question is, I'm interested in the treatment of um, cannabis and the effects of cannabis on the brain. Yep. Yes. Okay, so this is a question about cannabis and melanoma. Um, Can you just kind of rub the cream on Look, it's, we don't know enough 
about the specific uh, cannabinoids and cancer to really advise. There will be people that have used their own oil on melanomas and had them regress and go. But um, I am still a doctor and my thought for that is that melanoma is notorious for seeding. I mean, one cell only has to escape and you will have new disease. Um, and if something is not, like if you don't know how deep that melanoma goes, so you've got level one to level four, then um, you don't know whether those cells have already escaped at the time that you're treating the melanoma with the oil. So that may go and you might think you have successfully treated it, then a couple of years later you could just explode in secondaries. So it makes it very difficult for me to say trust just cannabis for melanoma. Um, for that reason, it's because it, it's a shit of a cancer. It really is. I really am a miracle. I shouldn't be here. Um, so that would be my advice is to, it is totally up to you as to what treatments you use for cancer, despite what the medical profession tries to tell us. Um, but I, I do think that um, you need to think about it very carefully and inform yourself very carefully. Um, would I do the same thing again? Would I go back and have the key truder and you know, I know what I know now? I don't know. Because we never know what we're going to be like when we're dying and what we'll do to stay alive. You know, you might get to that point. You might have a melanoma where they say, oh, look, you know, it looks like it's um, a level three, level four. And you might pike it and say, well, that's it. What drugs have you got for me? And off you go. Hey, that's totally fine. You know, because every person has to make their own decision. I'd never judge someone for going down the conventional path. Well, my sister did and she's passed away. Um, you know, but you, you know, each person has to, to decide for themselves what they want to do with cancer. Um, you know, I still went and did the conventional treatments. You know, even though I, you know, I knew that my chances weren't good, um, and that's what I mean. Knowing now what I know, would I go back and do those again? I might. I might say it was still worth it. Just maybe it wasn't the dendritic cell therapy that put me in remission. Maybe it was those. Maybe I should have them again. You know, that sort of thing. Um, so, does that make sense? Yeah, so, any more questions about cannabis and cancer? Because I'm very happy to talk about that. Depressing as it is, lots of words. Absolutely. And you've had, you've had people say, um, so you're saying all cancers are different. Um, you know, you've got ones that, um, like, where they're saying, oh, you know, um, this can make lung cancer, lung cancer worse, or you can't use this one in breast cancer, and blah, blah. We don't know. You know, we don't know. I think Israel is probably leading on the research for um, cannabis and cancer. Um, and because, it, and um, they come out with some interesting things, you know, things like, um, you know, we're talking about the different strains, the different cannabinoids. They ran a study where they had different results. One was extracted with coal ethanol and the other was extracted with supercritical CO2. And they had different results. So even the way you extract it can make a difference. And that might, you know, you might have a, someone come to you and say, this was working, but it's not working anymore. And you go back through and find out that, oh, that changed the method of extraction. And it's as simple as that. So, you know, like it's not a simple medicine. <laughs> it's a very complicated medicine. Um, but with um, cannabis and cancer, like, it would be lovely if we could use it as a treatment. Um, but it does require a real... It's one time when we do push nature, is to treat cancer. And the doses require very high, and you cannot function. I say to people, it's another chemo. It just happens to be a natural chemo that will never kill you. But by golly gee, you won't function. You know, if you're on 100 milligrams plus of THC and CBD a day, you won't be functioning. You know, <laughs> you'll be, you know, you'll eat. <laughs> but that's about it. <laughs> you'll eat and sleep. Um, and that's what we do. That's how you treat um, 
can uh, cancer with, with cannabis. It is another type of chemo. Um, but having said that, cannabis still has a huge place in cancer treatment. Um, you've got, um, you know, the side effects from the medication. Actually, my sister is actually a pretty good example to use for this. Um, when they brought it down from Townsville, and um, she was on a syringe drive that had morphine and midazolam in it, and um, and she had a bit of a, a turn and went downhill a little bit, and they whacked up the morphine and midaz, and they were giving it to her every time they turned her uh, as well, or washed her or anything like that. I um, mean, this was when we were having the fight to get the cannabis in there. And, um, and also she was on anti-epileptics because she'd had a previous cerebral secondary and was on it for that. So um, if she couldn't take that orally, then midazolam is an anti-epileptic as well. Um, and obviously that had to be there to a certain extent, which I accepted. But the thing I've always hated about midazolam and palliative care is that people don't remember. So they won't remember their visitors. And, and I really hate that in palliative care. Um, so once we got the cannabis thing underway, um, the doctors were actually really good and agreed to, they took the medaz out of the um, pain, the, you know, the one they would give her intermittently, and dropped it down and took it out of the syringe driver ultimately when she could swallow again. And, um, and she woke up. And she had a wonderful week and a half. Um, having her vape and listening to music and staying awake and engaging with all her visitors and eating the last morning I spent with her. I, I didn't realise it was the last hurrah, but it was. And, um, and my sister, she was a bit weird and she had, <laughs> she, as I said, she was just happy if she could smoke her cigarettes and her joints and she was happy, but she also liked playing the pokies. And, um, and she loved music and anyway, so on, the last, on that last morning, she was hungry and she just wanted to keep vaping and then she wanted, and she had a whole vanilla sausage in, which was the mistake, but anyway. Um, and she was conducting the music. She even read the time at the end of the bed. It's 25 past 12, when are they bringing lunch, which is not something that she'd done for days. And I think, oh, this is really great, you know. And, um, and then she was doing this thing, and I noticed she'd been doing it a few times, and I couldn't figure out what, and I think it's something to do with the music. And then she said, just out of nowhere, she said something about five lines. I thought, oh my God, she's playing the pokies. <laughs> so my sister, on her last morning, managed to eat, drink and be merry. She, she, would, she would hallucinate her cigarettes and hallucinate her joint and hallucinate playing the pokies. So she had a wonderful last morning. <laughs> so there you go, that's a, just a nice... You don't often get funny stories in palliative care, so I thought I'd share that one. Um, and unfortunately, they gave her morphine straight after that and on top of the sausage and she vomited, aspirated and she died two days later. But um, she did get to have that one while. And that often happens. If it hadn't been that, it would have been something else, as anyone do with palliative care knows. Um, so, any other questions? Yes? Uh, I've been asked, what did I do specially when I had cancer to do with diet and stuff like that? Well, not a great deal initially because, um, because basically I sort of didn't know what to do. Um, it, it, it sort of throws you a bit when you find out you're dying, um, especially when it comes as, as, you know, it was pretty quick really. I mean, melanoma is a bit bad for that. Um, but the things that I did start to do was research cannabis medicine and learn to grow herbs. I went out into the garden and I truly believe that's one of the things that healed me was the fact that I went out into the garden and so I was dealing with living things for a lot of the day. I was out in, with nature. I was getting all that lovely energy from the plants and as I grew my herbs and other greens and stuff like that, my diet started to improve. And I found myself um, not wanting the shit food that I used to like before. And this was something I never thought could ever happen. I was a shit food eater from way back. 
And I just thought, you know, I, yeah, I really honestly thought I would never be able to change my eating habits. And it's just done it on its own through growing my own herbs. I, I'm not very good at vegetables. We tend to grow miniature vegetables, but I'm really good at herbs. <laughs> And uh, yeah, and also we have to grow in pots a lot, not in the ground. I think that really impacts. So that's my my huge, my one piece of advice for anybody fighting cancer: get out into the garden. Yeah, yeah, and, and that's the other thing is that um, around the same time, again, the first seven years of the harvest, at the same time we discovered the gut microbiome, didn't we? And here's another whole new field of medicine, which is that, you know, we're carrying around a couple of kilos of bacteria in our gut. Kilos! Which is pretty, yes, kilos. I think it's one and a half to two kilos of bacteria, of, of our weight, is bacteria in our gut. Um, so we're a bit silly if we think they're not there for some reason, and they are. We've just, you know, they're meant to be there. So. Um, and, and you are absolutely right, that was the other thing that happened naturally, is that I started to eat a lot more prebiotics and I'm eating my own dirt. I'm, I'm, I'm creating my own local microbiome. And that is the wonderful thing about growing your own food, is that you necessarily will have a better gut because you're creating your very own microbiome that suits you from your local area where you live. Um, and so that was yet another thing, you know, that in the title of the talk, you know, um, the first seven years of the harvest. And I mean, it was really, just going back to that for a second, at that first rally that we did, it was so long ago we actually called it the Medical Marijuana March for the Sick and Dying. And I mean, now as you know, if anyone uses the word marijuana, they'll be lynched. Um, and that's actually quite ironic because Deb Lynch is one of the ones that would lynch you. <laughs> She's the president of MCUA. Um, yeah, and um, so, oh God, it's happened again. I'm going blank all the time this morning. It's dreadful. Oh, back to the, that's right. Um, um, oh, I had it again for a moment. Oh, come on, help me, guys. <laughs> help me, where was I up to? Ah, the microbiome, yep. Yeah. Okay, well, we'll just continue on from there. So, um, so in my usual very long-winded fashion, um, I would say that the, 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 the key thing that I did was to go out into the garden and start to grow my own herbs. And then I just became so utterly fascinated by the world of herbs as well as cannabis that I went to uni to, do, to study herbal medicine. And um, yeah, so I've, got, I've only got the clinical year to go, but I can't afford to relocate to Brisbane to do it. So there's a little bit of a hiatus there at the moment. And it sort of shits me because I don't need to do it. <laughs> you know, I mean, naturopathic, I've already done the naturopathic assessment part, and it's not a great deal different to being a doctor, it's just a bit more thorough. Um, so I sort of think, you know, can't they give me a bit of a break? But anyway, so I can answer questions on basic herbalism as well. Probably just need to do a bit of a refresher on some of it. Um, but I'm pretty good on nervines and adaptogens and things like that. And so, if I wanted to create um, a, a treatment regime for someone with cancer, then uh, most definitely it would include a herbal medicine regime because there are some wonderful cancer fighting herbs. There's heaps of them. The, how we've been lied to. Lied to by the pharmaceutical companies and the doctors. Because there are, there would be possibly hundreds of plants that will fight cancer. Um, and some of them are very powerful as well. Um, and it's been really fascinating when you go through the um, traditional herbs of each country, um, and they each have a herbal medicine regime um, for cancer using their own traditional herbs. So you'll see the, the um, South Americans have um, a whole heap of herbs like um, cat's claw and um, pow darko um, that are used for cancer. The Native Americans, you've got that, that woman that created that seven, that seven, four herb one with we? sheep. So, thank you. Yeah, there's that, that's the Native sort of American one. Um, and you'll get it for all the, uh, the Chinese um, herbal medicine, Ayurvedic, which is the Indian herbs. Um, you've got your European herbs and of course our Australian indigenous herbs. You know, we've got Gumby Gumby, 
um, that is a cancer fighting herb. We've got the indie bush which has you know natural antibiotics in it. Um, you know, so, and I've just been reading up, I grew a sticky hot bush, that's what they, they, they called it that because the first settlers made beer out of it. Um, but it's actually a really important pain-killing herb um, for Indigenous people. Um, you, but it's, I mean, hops, so, like, you can imagine chewing it for a toothache. I'm just thinking, oh my God, I just spew from the bitterness of it. Um, but they do use it smoking, you know, the, and things like that. Sticky hot bush, yeah, and so that was really interesting. Okay, so um, any other questions about cannabis and cancer before we leave that topic? Yes. P-E-A powder, is that an actual natural word? P-E-A, what does it stand for? Oh, one great very long word. I don't know, I've never heard of it. Okay, I'll bet Dr. Elaine up in Stanley Street for ah, Animal Wellness. There we go. Cannabis and animals. So, uh, any questions about that? Can we use cannabis to treat animals? Absolutely. Um, as a matter of fact, part of the reason I'm going to have to leave Mardi Gras early this year um, is because my 16-year-old dog is um, finally deciding that she's going to die, I think, after two years of... Um, <laughs> of taunting us with it. Um, and I really honestly think I've kept her alive with the cannabis oil. Because she, she just won't die with this dog. What are you giving her? Um, full, full, full spectrum, standard cannabis oil. Um, probably about a two to one THC to CBD. Okay. Yep. Um, she probably averages about um, five to seven milligrams. But she's been on it for a couple of years now because I could put her on it because I thought she was dying. <laughs> and then she just didn't die. She'd just have episodes and then get better again. Um, but she's, I think she's really doing it this time though. And so, yeah, but um, I've also had a couple of dogs with cancer, little dogs. Um, and I'm telling you, you cannot kill a dying dog with, with cannabis. You cannot do it. They still have to be put down by the vet. You can make them very comfortable and put them asleep, but they will not die. Um, and I can't think of anything. Oh, okay. Like um, yeah, it's a fatty acid amide. So, why does it cause a nuclear factor agonist? Okay, I'd have to research that one. That to me is more like a that to me is more like a um, a dietary supplement rather than a herb. It has something to do with opening up the calories in your body. Ah, okay. So I would say because it's a fatty amino acid. Um, that, that would be talking about um, ac getting access into the cell because do you know that your cells are actually surrounded by this, what we call a, li a, a lipid bilayer? And so, it's this, and so you've got the, the bits that are attracted to water head to the inside of, point to the inside of the cell and the bits that are attracted to fat point out, out that way. And embedded in these, um, in this fatty, lipid bilayer are the receptors that do everything. Not just cannabis receptors, all receptors. Oh, not all, but yeah. So um, basically, um, you need to have a really healthy cell membrane in order for all your biochemical processes to work properly. And it is especially essential for cannabis. Um, because of its structure and the fact that it is so, um, it, it actually is very what we call lipophilic. Um, it doesn't it doesn't dissolve in water or anything, and so for it to get into the cell membrane, it has to we have to get the two fatty bits attracting each other. And so if you've got a pretty shitty cell membrane, then you won't get as good absorption of your cannabinoids um, into the cell. And this is where eating hemp comes in handy because um, hemp seed is also a superfood. Um, the hemp seed oil contains the ratio of omega-3 and omega-6 uh, in, in hemp seed oil is roughly the same ratio that's found in our bodies. So when they talk about how good you know, the oily fish is with the omega-3s and stuff like that, and everybody says, oh, the omega-6s six, are really bad. 
The omega sixes cause inflammation. Um, and there are some oils that are very high in omega-6 and should probably be avoided for that reason. But, like with everything, we're meant to have some. And the ratio in hemp seed oil is the same that's found in the body. So, um, so or ha adding some hemp seed oil to your diet will help maintain and help activate your endocannabinoid system. It will help keep it healthy. Um, and there's, you know, I mean, there's other oils that are quite good too, like flaxseed oil and olive oil. Um, but hemp seed oil is very, very good too. And the whole temple, the, or the, the inner, inner part, is a complete protein. Now, um, you know, I didn't really know, even as a doctor, I actually didn't know this, but I was pretty disgusted with myself, actually. Um, but um, a complete protein is one that that contains all of the essential amino acids, um, so we don't have to um, eat any of them, because it's already there. Um, and our body does not make all of its amino acids. Um, but the whole hemp actually contains all of the essential amino acids. So just eating that is the same as eating an egg. An egg also is a complete protein. Um, soy and quinoa, they're the complete proteins of the plant world, and of course meat. You know, various meats, of course, will contain all of your essential amino acids. Um, so, um, it means that the hemp seed is a very useful addition to a vegan diet because it's a complete protein. And that is the problem with vegetarian and vegan diets is that they, are, will, they can often be protein deficient because of not eating meat. So... Um, so that too is something that keeps your endocannabinoid system healthy. Now while we're on the endocannabinoid system, any questions about that? Why is it important? Is there anything you don't know you'd like to know? Yes? What are the primary functions of the endocannabinoid system in the human body? So what are the primary functions of the endocannabinoid system in the human body? Okay, well primarily it's a regulator. It's a fine tuner. Um, I, as it can activate and inhibit, um, there are, at this point in time, two main cannabinoid receptors and we thought at first that they were um, pretty much divided up into, um, you know, the ones that were in your brain and your nervous system and the ones in the rest of the body. But we now know that you do have CB1 and CB2 receptors pretty much everywhere, just slightly more density in certain areas. And that leads me to a very important point as to why you cannot die from a cannabis overdose. And it is all to do with where the receptors are. In order to die from a drug overdose, it really has to act on your brain stem to stop your breathing or your heart. And there are virtually no cannabis receptors in the brain stem. Um, so it is absolutely impossible to overdose on cannabis um, the way that you can overdose on a narcotic. And, um, and that is, you know, as a doctor, that's very freeing. You know, so I can't understand why doctors aren't more enthusiastic. I mean, it's, it's, it's really nice to know you're not going to knock your patients off with your treatment. <laughs> like, really? And, um, but no, um, you know, basically, yeah. So, um, endocannabinoid system, right. There are a few more receptors that people are talking about. Um, but the thing to remember is they're not... Um, whereas CB1 and CB2 are pretty much exclusive to cannabinoids, the others, um, the, other, the, the other receptors are a bit sluffish, I think. They tend to, oh no, God, that's probably not politically correct these days, oh my God. Anyway, uh, yes. Promiscuous. Promiscuous, there you go, that's probably a better word. So they're a little more promiscuous and um, other um, other things other than just cannabinoids will attach to those receptors as well. Um, but it does lead us then on to how complicated it is because then we're starting to implicate the terpenes. And we haven't mentioned the terpenes yet, have we? Um, you know, everyone thinks that THC is the be all and end all, or CBD for that matter, but um, it's the terpenes that give you your stone. It's the terpene, well it's not, actually, it's not stone exactly, it's the terpenes that will create the quality and the type of your stone. Um, it's not the THC. So, when we talk about sativas and indicas, um, there's actually three. We've got um, 
ruderalis as well, which is the poor Russian cousin. Um, and they use the ruderalis mainly for breeding purposes to reduce the size of the plant, um, for especially for indoor grows, you know, the smaller the better, um, and it helps improve the yield. So, um, yeah, so with the, other than that, we don't talk about ruderalis very much. So we've got sativa and indica, and there's this big division between them. Um, but real, and, and it's a useful way to think about it. It's, you know, it's not setting stone, this is not how it is, but it's a good way to think about it. You talk about sativa traits and indica traits. So a sativa um, strain is the one that's more cerebral. It's the one that will make you more creative. It, it, it will keep you going through the day. Um, it will, um, in, in susceptible people, it's the strain that might make you a bit paranoid um, or edgy or whatever. Um, and it's not very good for sleep. It, a, 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 you know, a full sativa, 100% sativa, is more likely to keep you awake because you keep thinking, um, because it's very creative. Now, indic traits are more the ones that we're looking for, um, for pain relief, for sleep. You know, indic is the one that will give you couch lock where you're just on the couch uh, for like hours until the fridge calls. Uh, that's very indica. And, um, and then, and so it's very good for pain and sleep and all of those. Um, but you wouldn't want an indica first thing in the morning. You know, if you wanted to get up and do things, you have a, a, a huge, you know, being lung full of indica, then look, let's face it, you won't be doing anything else for a couple more hours, um, which can be fine, <laughs> but not necessarily what you want. So that's when we start to look at, um, and not even the medicinal side, just in the way it makes you function and feel, you have to look at the, at the strains. So it's basically, you're looking at sativa and indica, but the, with all the hybridisation that's going on, you can get any combination of anything now. So what we will tend to talk about, for example, it might have, say it's 20% sativa, 80% indica. So the best way is that's an indica dominant strain, as opposed to a sativa dominant strain. And if it's 50% of each, we call them 50-50 hybrids. So if you've got amnesia haze being one of the better known ones of the 50-50 hybrids, very, very good old um, strain for general medicine, amnesia haze, um, and it's a 50-50 hybrid. And that can be really useful because at lower doses it's fine during the day and at higher doses it will help you sleep because it's 50-50. And if money is an issue sometimes, you know, it, it might be more ideal to have two different strains for each situation, but sometimes you, you have to sort of compromise a little bit, and the 50-50 hybrid will help with that sort of compromise. Um, until you overdo it during the day one day, and you think, well, this is more indica than I thought. Um, so, and what else is there to talk about strains? Okay, so um, that's got, and then that's sort of got nothing to do with the percentages in the plant. This is just talking about the traits of the strain. So if you're wanting to create a medicine that will um, help someone with anxiety, then you're not going to go looking for 100% sativa because you're liable to send them off into anxiety hell by doing that. Um, so you would have a look at the high indica strains. Now, anxiety is something that happens during the day, so you might not want to give them 100% indica because, you know, it's all very well not being anxious, but you'd like to be able to function as well. Um, so you would probably look for a 30, 70, um, 40, 60 um, indica sativa, whereas it's not too much that will trigger off any further anxiety. Um, and it's just enough, and also you would put in um, quite a significant amount of CBD into that, but that's good. we're just talking about strains at the moment, just talking about the plant itself. Um, once it's extracted, it's a whole new ball game, and we can go there <laughs> if you want to. Um, but at the moment we're just talking about, yep, at the moment we're just talking about the different strains and why you choose what you choose. Um, so, um, and then, it gets extracted into a medicine. And this is where you'd really like to know more about the minor cannabinoids in the plant. Good, good God, there's over 140 of them. And we are starting to figure out, you know, which ones do what. Um, and then, um, you know, and then, what's the point I'm trying to make is that, 
Um, it's, it goes back a little bit to what I was saying before about um, that it's it's a re it's a really individual thing. Like you can do guidelines, but um, you know that person might come back to you and say, "No, that drove me up the wall," and then you think, "Oh God, she's going to need like heavy indica for this anxiety." And so you will then use 100% indica, and for that person it works fine, and they don't go to sleep or anything. <laughs> go figure. But what the doctors are doing is saying, oh, well, it doesn't work. You know, and so we're up to this mentality where, you know, you're trying to get it through to them that um, you don't know <laughs> that it doesn't work yet because you've only tried one and only one strain, you know, and things like that. Um, so that... So getting into the extracted oils is then getting into the very complicated cannabis medicine. Um, people who grow their own, um, you know, generally, um, they will, you know, if they extract their own medicines, they can muck around it with it, they can do what they like. A bit what I was saying before is that three quarters of the people can do what they like. It's the other quarter that need real guidance and where real medicine and a good doctor who knows cannabis medicine would be really useful at that time. Um, because, it, yeah, it starts to get really complicated. Like, I mean, as I sort of say, arthritis. Most people with arthritis do really well with the 4 to 1 THC CBD. Um, but then you'll get someone that comes back and says, look, I can't even function on that, you know, blah, blah, blah. So you might make it half and half and see how they go. And then they come back and say, that's much better. And as a matter of fact, the, the higher CBD seems to be helping more with the pain in the joints than the THC. So you go, oh, well, the anti-inflammatory effect of the CBD is really kicking in. And so I think I'm just trying to give you a bit of a feel for what, you know, what it's like to, to practice cannabis medicine properly, you know, where you talk about it and, and, uh, and where you're guided instead of being told what to do. You know, like, I mean, I, I still can't understand why medicine is still so patriarchal and more than half of us are women. What the fuck? <laughs> and yet it is. It's still very patriarchal where, you know, you do as you're told. You do what your doctor tells you, you know. And oh, well, I wasn't really a doctor like that. Though I did have, I did have a few men patients that um, had to be persuaded to come in because Dr. Deb was going to give them a serve. Um, like the guy who went to Thailand just before he had his liver function test done and wondered why they were through the roof. He sort of think, mate, <laughs> you're going to go to the doctor. Don't, you know, don't get your blood test as soon as you come back from Thailand. <laughs> but, yeah, exactly. Uh, things like that. Yeah, so I wasn't a really heavy sort of doctor. But, yeah, and I mean, and, and as a patient, oh, my God, it makes no difference that I'm a doctor, I can tell you. You get just as bad treatment. As a matter of fact, sometimes you get worse treatment, especially from nurses, because they think, oh, fuck, it's a doctor. You know, they're going to want everything. Um, yeah, and, um, and a lot of egos. Um, and it doesn't really make much difference. Okay, so we've got 10 minutes to go. Again, I'll ask for particular topics. CBD isolate and liver function. Ah, okay. Well, there's an interesting thing about CBD. You know how I was saying before about, you know, the whole be all and end all of CBD and that, you know, really in the plant, it doesn't exceed 2%. That's in nature. Um, so, but because of the psychoactive thing and everybody going rah, rah, then um, we want CBD only now. So, of course, what's happened is that they've isolated it. So it's an unopposed cannabinoid. And unfortunately, in their wisdom, the TGA, our distri Australian distributors for Big Pharma, which is all they are, um, has decided that um, that's all we're going to get in pharmacies. So, yay, everyone goes, we can get CBD in pharmacies, we can get higher dosages, yay. They're isolates. So, unless you're smoking a bit of weed with it, you're getting an unopposed cannabinoid, and that's never good. Um, so, and you'll find that those of us that have started, been in this from the beginning, um, we are pretty anti-isolates and very anti-synthetics. Isolates have their place, don't get me wrong, especially where the minor cannabinoids are concerned, because there's not many of them, it would be very expensive to extract it, you know, and put them on their own, but um, if you're wanting a medicine that you know works, but you can't um, get that particular str or those strains or whatever, you can then approximate that same medicine using isolates. 
So you start out with a full spectrum product and you add isolates to get a cannabinoid profile that you'd like. But to me, that's still in the future. You know, this is the, this is the ideal. You know, the idea would be to put a drop of the patient's blood in a machine and it spits out their cannabinoid profile that would heal their disease. That, to me, would be the, the way to go. Um, and then you would just get a complete individualised look, you know, because everyone's different. Oh, the second part of your question, the first part of your question was just talking about um, CBD and isolates. And oh, the, the second part was... Liver function. Liver function, yes. Really important point, this. Um, is that CBD is a cannabinoid that interacts with other drugs. It's not THC. It gets processed through a different enzyme system in the liver, um, but, but CBD gets processed by the uh, PY50, whatever it is, which I can never remember, um, which processes a lot of drugs, including, most importantly, anti-epileptics. This, and again, I can, re, I can only reiterate, if you're in that quarter that, you know, you've already got an existing illness, you're already taking big pharma products, then you really need a doctor to guide you. And, um, and so we know about pro interacts, which is a pretty common um, anti-epileptic, and we suspect a few others. I think now, I think there's probably more research, I haven't researched it recently, I suspect that they will have identified more drugs that will interact with CBD. Um, and it's really interesting because there's one person I know that really, really needs CBD, but they can't have it because um, as soon as they try and up the CBD, it interacts with one of the big pharma ones and it starts to have more seizures. Um, so it's really frustrating because it's the sort of situation that if cannabis medicine was accepted mainstream and blah, 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 then you would admit him to hospital and withdraw him off the big pharma products and start to increase his THC and CBD till he can be managed on the least amount of big pharma products possible. But of course we can't do that. You know, this is not something that you would do outside of hospital when someone seizes just because they get a bit too much CBD. You know, like these are not, you know, this is not something that you could do at home. Um, but we don't have that ability yet because of the non-acceptance of doctors of what cannabis medicine actually is. Yes? What can we do to then take some THC and CBD and find the right combination for ourselves? Like, what can we do? What can we do? Okay, so what can we do to find um, our own combination of, of cannabinoids for ourselves? Well, um, it's, it is trial and error. Uh, you probably already know what sort of strains suit you just through smoking or vaping if you're a cannabis user. Um, you may notice that certain strains work better for pain. Um, you may notice that certain strains work better to increase your appetite or help you sleep. So that's what you go along when you go along and see your cannabis clinician. They're the things you talk about first up. And there are some general medicines that they will try that, as we say, will work for three quarters of the population, so they start from there. If you wanted to do it yourself, it actually would be, it's more difficult because you just can't access the variety that you'd need to really figure it out. Um, so the, the important things, though, are knowing what strain that you've got and then your percentages of THC and CBD in whatever medicine you get. Um, we do some of the legal things. You, all of the legal products, you can access the cannabinoid profile if you want it. But they don't just give it to you. But I've noticed that you know, they will all offer you a cannabinoid profile to look at. And that's what you really need to use. And you might notice that if you have one with this amount of this, you know, with this amount of, of a minor cannabinoid, that it affects you differently, so you cross that one off your list. You know, it's, it's that sort of thing. Did that answer the question? Yeah, kind of. Um, the, if you don't know the strain that you prefer, or because you're not much of a cannabis smoker, um, can the clinician tell you? Like, yes, yeah, it's called, basically it's called guidelines. 
you know, and as you know, like you can actually get deregistered for not following ARPA's guidelines now. But these are different guidelines. These are good guidelines because what it is is that um, when you first come to the doctor with your problem that you would like to treat with cannabis medicine, um, you really, yeah, you don't know. Um, so you're not the one with the knowledge at that point. The doctor has the knowledge. So um, the doctor hopefully does a good diagnosis and you know, history, examination, everything. And they will say, this is what we recommend to start with. So then it's up to you to monitor how you go. You know, and also to give feedback to the doctor. You know, like it's no point in going back in and saying, oh yeah, it worked okay. Yeah, well, okay is not brilliant. So then you sort of have to say, well, okay, how did it not work okay? You know, um, and then you take it from there. And they might say, first of all, let's just increase the dose, decrease the dose, blah, blah, blah. Let's try a completely different oil. Let's try a completely different ratio. It can go anywhere, you know, and that's the wonderful thing about it, you know. And then what happens is that over time, you will know. It will be a learning process for both you and the doctor, um, and then you will know, you'll be able to go and say, look, I really know that if I have more than 20% sativa in it, it's going to drive me up the wall, for example. You see what I mean? Okay, does that answer the question better? Okay. And you had one? Um, okay, uh, talking about treating anxiety and, you know, getting your levels of indica and CBD correct. Um, look, it's a very easy thing to get treated using legal cannabis. Um, you know, anxiety is fine. Uh, any any in Queen, All the states are different. In Queensland, we actually should be very proud of ourselves because we've actually got of a very bad law legislation, we're probably the best in Queensland, would you believe how we ever did that? I think the flower thing got through. I don't think they noticed until it was too late. Um, but we're quite lucky in Queensland because every GP can prescribe it if they want to. Most choose not to. Um, you will not avoid getting totally ripped off at a cannabis access clinic, unless you are lucky enough to find a wonderful GP who's willing to do the hours of work to get your approvals through. Uh, they're very thin on the ground. So you have no option but to be ripped off by a cannabis access clinic and be ripped off totally buying your weed and your medicine. Um, you know, but basically you'll be lucky to get out of it in less than $1,000 a month. So I'm on three different medications, two big pharma, one cannabis. The other two cost me less than $50 a month. The cannabis cost me over 1000 which I can't do most of the time. So we're back to the green market. Now, that's another thing. I've been trying to make this point for years. Um, please don't talk about this place as being the black market. We're the green market. You know, um, yeah, we don't use chemicals. You know, anybody, they will all be growing organically now. Whether it's indoor, greenhouse, outdoor, doesn't matter, as long as it's organic. Um, yes, <laughs> I must admit. So now, back to your question about the um, THC. Yeah, last, yeah, and this is the last question. Um, so that would be um, the, the easiest thing to do in terms of you would be given an indica um, medicine and a CBD and you would, you would mix and match it yourself to find the, the right levels of indica and CBD to help um, as well as um, oil is a, is, very, is a very good background for a lot of, you know, most mental health problems should be on some form of oil as a base and then just using um, flour to, to, for certain symptoms, you know, that they want quick control. If we're looking at the green market, um, the hemp embassy's got a great selection of most of their oils are indica as far as I can tell, but you can't guarantee it. Um, but the CBD, they've got good CBD there. So at least, you know, if you can get yourself some indica, even just to smoke, and get some CBD oil, that's a start um, on the green market. And my advice is don't go anywhere near any black market.
um, weed. You know, most of it now is organised crime. 